mighty bird Jesus who rescued me from that grave Yahweh Yahweh who gets the glory and praise nobody but Jesus who rescued me from that grave Yahweh Yahweh who gets the glory and praise nobody but Jesus
guys can be seated this morning. All right. Hey, y'all make some noise if y'all are glad to be here today. Hey, uh, make even more noise if you are mentally ill today. Okay, y'all are all just like, mm, not me. <laughs> like, I invited my friend because he's the crazy one, right? Okay, if you, uh, if you don't know uh, who of your friends is the crazy one, you are the crazy one, all right? <laughs> so I'm just letting you know. Um, hey, we are so excited that you're here today. Obviously, today is Mental Health Sunday. This is an important uh, Sunday for us because we, uh, we believe as followers of Jesus, it's important for us to be spiritually healthy. It's also important for us to be mentally and emotionally healthy as well. Um, and there's, there's a lot to get into, so I'm going to jump right into it. Um, but the reason we want to speak to this is really a couple of reasons. The reason that I'm personally passionate about this is really for a couple of reasons is one, just how prevalent mental illness is. Um, in our society and even within Christian community, that there's lots of Christians who are dealing with mental illness. Um, in fact, I've got a few stats for you. Here's what the National Institute of Mental Health says. In 2021, there were an estimated 57.8 million adults aged 18 or older in the United States with any mental illness with any mental illness. And so when we talk about mental illness, we actually use that very broad term on purpose. We're not just talking about anxiety and depression. We're talking about other types of mental illness that people struggle with, that they have um, maybe an ailment. Some people are obsessive compulsive. Some people are um, ADHD. Some people deal with schizophrenia. Some people deal with all kinds of, and, and, and really the point that we want to take from this is we live in this sinful and broken world, and this is the reality for us. But, but the interesting thing is we have this dynamic of being followers of Jesus, and how do we be followers of Jesus and follow him faithfully and navigate the complexities that come with our mental health and with mental illness? And so it's important for us to address this. There's a lot of people that are dealing with mental illness. This number that I just read, 57.8 million, that represents 22.8% of all U.S. adults. Okay, so this affects a lot of people. And if you break it down by uh, age group, this is, this is what the numbers break down to. 15% of adults aged 50 and older would say that they have dealt with mental illness. 28.1% of adults aged 26 to 49 years deal with mental illness. 33.7% of young adults aged 19 to 25 would say they deal with some sort of mental illness. Are you seeing the trend here? 49.5% of adolescent aged kids, 13 to 18, would say that they deal with mental illness. This is a problem. Okay, so it's obviously this is an issue. And, and, and at Progression Church, we don't want to be a church that buries our head in the sand and acts like nothing's wrong and acts like there aren't issues that the world is struggling with, but even more so that you guys aren't struggling with. I want you to know you're in the right place if you're struggling with your mental health. It's very, very prevalent. So this is a problem. Now, the second reason that I'm really passionate about this issue is because this is a struggle that I share personally in my own life. Um, and, and, and if you're anything like me, I didn't know where it was coming from, and I didn't know what to do about it. So for me, I've dealt with um, anxiety for most of my life. As long as I can remember, I can remember having anxious thoughts and anxious feelings. And then that would be uh, tailed or followed by depressive thoughts and feelings. And for the longest time, I didn't even know what it was. I didn't even know what to call it. I just knew that I didn't feel right. And then it culminated and culminated and as I got older and even to my, my, um, my pastoral work and um, even here as pastor of Progression Church, I started to notice that my anxiety was getting worse and worse and I didn't know how to deal with it. And so I tried to pray it away and it wouldn't go away, but it would get so bad that I was regularly having panic attacks. Um, I was working 
two jobs whenever we initially started here. And so I worked at a grocery store. There were multiple shifts that I had to just tell my boss, I, I can't work. I, I have to go home. I, I, I feel terrible. I'm panicky right now. I, I have to go home. And I would take that walk of shame to my car like, what is happening to me? There were multiple occasions when I felt dizzy, lightheaded, tired. My kids would want to play with me, and I didn't have the energy. I would cut as much physical activity out of my life as I could, and yet I still woke up feeling tired, anxious, and depressed. So this is a journey that I have walked, and that I'm even currently walking. And so that's why this is very, very important to me. And and I think a really big relief is to kind of help know, hey, what's going on with me? Where is this coming from? And so let's address that really quick. Um, mental illness can develop from any combination of risk factors. It may be one, it may be multiple, okay? But here's just a few of the uh, causes of mental illness or, or struggles with anxiety or depression or any other things. Um, the first is genetics, right? So it just may just run in your family. Okay, this is just a a hereditary reality for you. For others of us, it's biological factors. You may have, uh, there may be a chemical imbalance in your brain, that there's something biologically going on. For others of us, it may be uh, personality issues. So some of us, if there's any, any people in the house, you would say you're a perfectionist, okay? Like you want it done a certain way, you want it done the right way, like the right way exists, right? Perfectionism can sometimes take us over and it can hold us hostage. For others of us, you just have nervous, a nervous personality. You just have a nervous tendency. For others of us, it's life experiences. Maybe you've experienced something in your past that has marked you and that as you've gone forward, you've noticed that it started to to play a role in your life and even caused you to feel anxious and depressed um, and to struggle with your mental illness. Recent findings have also come to show that outside factors and stimuli will cause issues, right? So that includes technology and social media. The numbers are in. Social media is bad for your mental health, okay? The numbers are in. And so what we do is we engross ourselves in technology and social media, and it swallows us up, and it leads, in, leads us into this pattern of mental illness where we're struggling emotionally and we're struggling mentally, okay? And so we have this struggle. It's it's a very real struggle. I don't have to convince you that the struggle exists because many of us are dealing with it, but what do we do about it? Like, how do we address it? How do we be faithful to God, but also deal with the realities of what we're feeling and experiencing, okay? And so if you told me, hey, Pastor Joe, um, I'm struggling with my mental illness I'm struggling with mental, emotional health. Can we get together? Can I take you out to coffee and just get your insight and get your advice, okay? And so we sit down to coffee. I'm sitting across the table from you, and you say, how can I be emotionally and mentally healthy? Um, Here's what I'm most likely going to tell you. I'm probably going to tell you these two things, okay? And it's this. The first, draw near to God draw near to God. I'm a pastor. Of course I have to tell you that, right? But it's because I believe it. I'm going to tell you, draw near to God. And then here's the second thing I'm going to tell you, depending on your situations, it may vary, but most of the cases, I'll tell you this, seek the help of a professional. Seek the help of a professional, whether that's a professional counselor Uh, Maybe that's even a physician. Maybe that's a doctor, depending on what your situation is. We're going to talk, and I'm going to hit those two things. I'm going to say, hey, you need to draw near to God, and you need to seek the help of of a professional. And so some of you are like, wait, what? You're telling me I have to look somewhere outside of the spiritual? Yes, and we're going to get to that in just a minute, why it's not the way you perceive it. The interesting thing about the human condition, and this is what you see in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Um, Paul, uh, his desire for us, he says, for Christians, for the believers in Thessalonica, is that they would be sanctified completely. And then he said, through and through, your whole body, your whole soul, and your whole spirit. And so what we want you to know is you are a, a holistic being. In your completeness, you are body and spirit. You are not just a body, 
with a spirit. You are not just a spirit that lugs around a body. In your holistic form, you are body and you are spirit. And so we have to address the issue as though you are body and spirit. Okay? And so what I want to do is I want to start off with the draw near to God part. Okay? Let's start with the draw near to God part. And then I've got some friends of mine that are going to come up and we're going to talk about um, some, some other things that I think you're going to find helpful. Okay? Uh, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 4. I mean, this is just... You got to teach this when you're dealing with anxiety, when you're dealing with worry, when you're dealing with stress. And so we're going to be in Philippians chapter 4. Um, we're going to start at verse 4. And the context is simply this. Paul is writing um, from prison. Uh, Paul is uncertain of his fate. He doesn't know if he is going to die soon. So he is in a very distressful situation. But he's also writing to a group of people, the Philippian Christians, Um, who understand what it means to be persecuted and oppressed by the Roman government, right? So that means being isolated in society. That means being cut off from certain sectors of society. That means being put to death. That means being tortured. They were dealing with very real issues as Christians in a Roman society. And so Paul is writing to them, he, in a very distressing situation, to a group of people in a very distressing situation. And let's look at what Paul has to say. In verse 4, it says this. He's going to sound like a madman when we start, okay? But we're all a little crazy. All right, verse 4 says this. This is Paul. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again rejoice. In other words, he's saying, in case you missed it, I want you to rejoice. Okay. Verse five, let your graciousness be known to everyone. And then this next phrase is key. I think it's really important for a lot of us. He says, the Lord is near. And so I just want to stop and pause there just for a second. And I want to let you know, like, I know you feel like you're alone in your struggle. I know that you, you feel like nobody really understands what you're going through, or maybe you just feel like a one-off, and you feel so isolated and alone, and you're struggling, and let's keep it real. You feel like God is nowhere to be found in this struggle. I just want to encourage you and let you know, God is near. God is near in all of your struggles. He is near in this struggle as well. No matter how much you feel like you're struggling, I think you need to know that God is with you in the midst of this. He promises to always be with us, and he is near. Let's look at verse 6. Don't worry about anything, but in everything through what? Prayer. Prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Present your requests to God. Here's the first thing I want to let you know very quickly. Worry is a reminder to pray. Worry is a reminder to pray. And so whenever we bump into these situations where we want to be stressed about a certain situation or or, or something that's out of our control, or maybe it's something in our control, and we're stressed and we're worried and we're anxious, Paul would say, hey, in that moment, I want you to capture that thought and I want you to use that to pray. It's time to pray and petition to the Lord. Make your request known to God. And so I would encourage you firstly, just be raw with God and let him know what's going on in your heart, in your mind, in your soul, emotionally how you're feeling. Give that to God. Okay? And so firstly, I would just want you to know that if we're going to draw near to God, we're going to view worry as an invitation or a reminder to enter in to prayer. We're going to recognize and replace worry with prayer. Let's look at verse 7. We're moving quick because we've got a lot of stuff to cover. Verse 7, Paul tells us that we need to pray, and then there's, then there's going to be um, um, something that comes on the other side of this prayer, and it's this. Verse 7, and the what? The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will do what? Will guard your hearts. And your what? Minds in Christ Jesus. I'm going to read verse 7 one more time. That when when we teach ourselves to replace worry with prayer, 
consistently, here's the result. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, if anybody has got the right to speak that and mean it, and for us to lean in and listen to it, it's Paul. He's been through a lot. He's about to go through a lot. And he tells them, pray, go to God in prayer, draw near to God in the peace of God. It's going to guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Here's the second thing I would tell you. Prayer leads to peace. Prayer leads to peace. You seeing how this works? Worry is a reminder to pray and prayer leads to peace. Now, you're going to pray sometimes, and you're not going to feel like it's making a difference in that moment, but when you keep showing up and keep showing up and keep showing up and keep showing up, God is, begins to do this work in your spirit, inside of you, in your heart, and in your mind, and you're going to feel the difference. You're going to experience the peace. And then we're going to wrap things up with verses 8 and 9. Paul says this. So he tells them to pray because prayer leads to peace. And then he says this in verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any moral excellence, if there's anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Dwell on these things. Paul uses a Greek word. It's pronounced logizomai. It means to think about, dwell on these things, think about these things that are worthy, praise worthy. And then in verse nine, he says, do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me and the what? Peace of God will be with you. We're going to pray. We're also going to think about the goodness of God. We're going to pray because prayer leads to peace. And then we're also going to think about, to set our minds on. Paul says in his letter to uh, the Colossian Christians, he says, set your mind on things above, not earthly things. And so we are going to legizomai, legizomai, on these things. Dwell. Think about the goodness of God. Now, this doesn't mean that all your worries are going to go away. You're still going to have worries and you're still going to have struggles. But here's the thing that I've learned about setting my mind on God and who God is and thinking about God and all the things that are praiseworthy about God and adoring him. Here's what I've noticed. Um, I've noticed that sometimes my problem doesn't necessarily get smaller or even dissipate the way that I want to. Like I would say, God, take away my anxiety, make it disappear, make it go away. But that doesn't always happen. In fact, most of the time that doesn't happen. But whenever I set my focus on God, when I go to him in prayer, when I'm seeking his peace, when I'm thinking about his goodness and his greatness, I notice something. He begins to come to become bigger than my worry. The worry may not shrink. The worry may not dissipate. The feelings may not dissipate. But, but interestingly enough, as I do this, as I dwell on God, he begins to become bigger and greater and more powerful than what I may be stressing about. Does that make sense? And so that's what I would teach you in drawing near to God. This is the first thing we would cover across the coffee table. I would say, are you investing in your relationship with God? Are you drawing near to God? Here's four very practical ways that you can draw near to God, okay? And then we're going to shift gears a little bit and do, do things a little bit different, okay? How can we dwell on the goodness and the greatness of God? How can we draw near to God? Um, Four, four things, word, worship, prayer, and community. Word, worship, prayer, and community, okay? I know that this is like, alert the media. This is shocking news to you that your pastor is telling you to read your Bible, okay? But we need to lean into the word of God. We need to spend time in God's word regularly, okay? Now, if you believe this is a step for you and you need help and you have questions, please let one of us know as pastors, we're happy to help you. 
It's our job, man. We want to help you find a system or a plan that you can read God's word with, but engage with the truth of God's word. The next thing is worship, okay? Here's my challenge to you this week. When we set our minds on things above and not earthly things, we literally mean fixing your mind on purpose. This is not just some passive um, exercise. This is a practice. And so my challenge to you is, I want to challenge you to listen to good, good worship music this week. Replace whatever it is that you're putting in your mind and what you're letting um, into your soul. I want you to replace that with worship. Set your mind on things above. Set your mind on God. Legiza my on these things. Think about his goodness. And so my challenge for you is to listen to worship music this week. And here's the cool thing that we did for you. If you'll look at the card in your chair, there's a card that says Mental Health Sunday. There's a QR code. We have a playlist of all the worship songs that we have either played or are about to play at Progression Church. Whether you're a Spotify person or an Apple Music person, you just use that QR code and you can subscribe to that playlist. And so take that playlist and use it this week. Um, and, and these are songs that are going to sound familiar to you because they're what we sing at Progression Church. And so uh, my challenge to you is to, that is one of the ways that we dwell on God and think about God. The next is prayer, okay? We've already spoken to prayer. Um, but here's another thing that we've done to help resource you. Um, we want to dwell and think about the goodness of God. We're going to pray, but we're going to set our minds on him and it's going to help us. And so we also, under our resources page, we have a prayer of adoration page set where you can think about the different characteristics of God. And you just click on one of those characteristics and it gives you a very simple one sentence, two sentence prayer. And it gives you the scripture that it's based on. We are setting our minds on things above, not things of the earth. And you can find that through the QR code on your card. Okay. Um, next is community. We need to tell someone that we're struggling. We need to open up and let somebody know that we're having a hard time. Um, and, and you're going to find that there's freedom and healing in that, okay? So we sit across the table, and this is what I tell you. That's the first thing I'm going to tell you. And then the next, I'm going to say you need to get some professional help. And we think, wow, but that's not very godly. Okay, it is, and, and we're going to talk about that. So I want to welcome my friends Ryan and Taylor to the stage with me, okay? Y'all make some noise for Ryan and Taylor. Make some noise for our nifty chairmen. Because, you know, when you're the speaker, you shouldn't have to touch a chair, you know? Somebody should do that for you, okay? Um, so here's what we want to do. We want to move into the professional, uh, the help of a professional sure. realm, okay? Um, so uh, this is Taylor. Taylor, say hello to everybody. Good morning, everybody. My name is Taylor. Um, I'm a senior here at LSU, and I've been coming to Progression for going on four years. Yeah, y'all make some noise for Taylor. And then refresh us on your name. We're not entirely sure. Ryan. Ryan. Okay, yeah. Y'all all know Ryan. Ryan is our worship pastor here at the church. And the reason that I've got Taylor and Ryan up here and also myself is we have been doing professional counseling for a little while, some of us longer than others. Um, but why don't we just get started by just share with us how long you've been doing counseling, like professional counseling. How long you, how long you been at it? What about you, Taylor? Um, so I texted one, so it was a random day last semester. I texted Pastor Joe and I asked him like, Hey, I think I want to start doing counseling. And, um, he sent me some recommendations. So I started at the center for emotional healing back in November last semester. And I've been going every other week since then. At first I started going weekly, but, um, as time went on, I realized I can just go every other week cause that was more feasible for me. And um, also gave me time to actually reflect on things that we talked about and make some changes and stuff like that. Okay, cool. Yeah, Ryan, Me and Ariel you? were talking about this, and initially I was like, oh, I think three years. And she was like, no, boo, you've been going for like six years. So I've been going to counseling for six years, which is crazy. It doesn't feel like that long, but that's all. Dang, long that's been. awesome. Okay, I've, I've been seeing a professional counselor for, I have five to six years, but I think I've been seeing one longer than you. So I'm going to say six years plus. Okay. Okay, yeah. so <laughs> maybe five and you gotcha. maybe six. 
I'm emotionally healthier. <laughs> um, okay, so our, awesome. So that's how long you guys have been seeing one. Um, let me ask y'all this. Is it different from what you imagined? A lot of times we envision something in our mind when we're like, oh, go talk to a therapist, go talk yeah. to a counselor. Yeah. Um, was it different from what y'all imagined and, and how? How would you say it? It, was it was in some ways. I mean, you see on TV, you see a person go into a room and they lay on a couch and they talk to somebody and they, you know, talk about the problem size and make you feel that kind of thing, you know. And it was like that in a lot of ways. You go into a room, there's a couch, it's comfy, you sit on it, you know, and uh, you talk to a counselor. But I think the difference is that they, like Joe was saying earlier, they are trained, they are professional, um, and they are there to help you. So it's not like you just telling, you know, your problems. They are there to help you along, so it's a dialogue. And I think that's how it was different was you just think, well, I'm going to go in here and just tell this person my problems and then you know, we're going to talk about how it makes me feel and then we're going to carry on. But it was much more than that, I think, because they are trained and they are professional and that's what they are gifted to do. Um, so I think that's how it was different for me was just like, oh, this is very personal. You have been trained to do this. And so I think that's how it was different for, you know, in my brain. Mm. Yeah. Um, for me going into it, I didn't really have any expectations. I just knew I prayed for it. I prayed for God to send me um, a counselor, just somebody I can go to and actually have a safe place outside of my friend group. Because one thing I learned, like Pastor Joe was saying earlier, like they are trained for that. However, like they're trained for things, obviously, that our friends can't not do. Mm, so it's yeah. like um, that was how it worked out for me. Like it was I didn't expect anything, but it was it was it was um, exactly what I needed. So um, she just provided a safe place for me. And like now going back there, it's like I know I'm safe here. Like I can give you my raw emotions. I don't have to like hold anything in. I don't if I got to cuss, I'm going to do that. If I got to do this, I'm going to do that. So it's like just having that safe place. That was exactly what I needed. So, yeah, you just admitted to cussing in front of your pastor. <laughs> all right, let's go. Um, all right. I kid. Um, yeah, for, for me, it was, okay, I'm either going to handle this spiritually or I'm going to go see a counselor. That's kind of how I viewed it, um, that I was essentially selling God out if I'm going to go see a counselor, if I'm going to use any other means. But what I quickly learned is there are counselors, there are therapists, there are people who are professionally trained and understand the science of the human brain who love Jesus dearly. And they are so helpful. What I thought I was going to get was I was going to sit in a room and I was going to go, I'm so stressed. And then they're going to go, you need to pray. Yeah, right. You need to trust God. Yeah. And then they would ask me to say amen. And then I'd go, amen. <laughs> and then they would go, let's pray. And then pray and then charge me $300, right? That's kind of what I expected. That is not what I got. Yeah. I got somebody who loved the Lord dearly um, and said, hey, I, I love God. We can talk about God. I, know, I understand he's an important part of your life. He's an important part of my life, too. We can go there. Hey, but I, I've got some tools and some very practical things. I understand the science of this, and we're going to go through this, and we're going to work on this. If you need to, we can talk about the God stuff as well, and we will. But it all merges together. This all works in unison. We are holistic beings. We are body and soul. And so we're, when we're treating ourselves, we are treating body and soul and soul. And so that was a, that was a big difference that I noticed. But let me ask you guys, um, how is seeing a counselor, what would you say are some of the benefits that you've, that you've seen in your own life and even in your faith, yeah. right? Because a lot of times we think I can either do this by faith or I can either do this by science, right? It's a false dichotomy. Right. Okay. Um, so what would you guys say is the biggest difference you've noticed in yourself personally, um, and, and even spiritually? Um, for me, I would say, so, I mean, it's definitely made me a better father and a better husband and a better, you know, follower of Jesus for sure. Um, but when I first went to counseling, like Joe was saying earlier, like I thought it was just a spiritual problem. When I first went to counseling, I was having this like crisis of faith, struggling with my salvation. I was like, I'm not a Christian. I, I, I don't know what to do. I, and I was just stressing out about it so, so much. And then when I went to counseling, I realized that that was just a symptom of mm. things that were going on in my life that were buried underneath the surface. I didn't have, I couldn't have identified what those things were. I couldn't have communicated it to anyone. Mm. But my counselor walked me through and was just kind of like helping me see, look, there are so many things underneath the surface of this Think the symptom that you think is the mm. primary problem, but there are so many things going on underneath the surface 
Um, and so she was able to give me words and help me to identify things that were going on in my heart and in my life. You know, a new vocabulary was opened up to my heart and life. Mm. So it was like, like Joe was saying earlier, she gave me tools so that, because I mean, I struggle with anxiety, you know, that's a, you know, it's a struggle that I have. But now I have tools and I have vocabulary and I have ways to combat against it. And like Joe was saying earlier, my counselor too, she loves the Lord. And so we talk about the Lord and that is the primary thing that we discuss is, you know, how this, you know, works in my relationship with him. Um, but I just think it just opened up a whole new world of being able to identify things that were going on inside of me that I did not know were there, yeah. you know? Um, and so that just helped a whole bunch. And so obviously if you're dealing with things that are in your heart and in your mind and in your life and you're getting that out, you're just a healthier person, you yeah. know? So I just, I am healthier because I have ways to communicate about this. I have somebody helping me navigate this who is wise and loves Jesus. And so I think that that was probably the biggest way that it helped me. So if I'm healthier as an individual, I'm going to be better at other things. I'm going to be a better father. I'm going to be a better husband. You know, I'm going to be better at this thing. I'm going to be a better follower of Jesus. And I think too, all obviously partnered with that is like understanding how your struggle re- like is, you know, your, like your relationship with God, how that all works together is mm-hmm. also just really helpful. Like knowing that he sees these things and he knew these things were in me before I did, you know, like, and he got me to this place where I am with a counselor, you know, so it was just really, that, you know, that just helps your relationship with yeah, Jesus. Yeah, so. man, that's so true. Like, and even as like your friends and pastors, like me and Brian, I, there's just no telling how many times we've been like, yo, you're a Christian. I don't know what you want me to tell you, yeah. right? Like you're a believer, okay? Um, but it, it's funny that it took counseling yeah before we started to see real progress in your life where you were just like, I'm, I think I'm beginning to experience some healing in this, right? Which is really, really, really cool. What about you, Taylor? You would think me and Ryan kind of rehearsed this together, but we didn't because we're kind of going to say the same thing. (laughs) But um, I would say for me how it's benefited my life as well as my faith. It allowed me to, like he said, like have language for things that I was going through, but it also allowed me to go deeper not to just you know be along the surface because a lot of things that we experience like anxiety, depression, like he said, those are symptoms, meaning those are roots, are branches, but it all comes from one root. And until we dig to see like what the root is, what the root of the problem is, we can't really we can't really make any progress. Um, so it's allowed me to not only acknowledge myself as a follower of Christ, but also as a human. I'm human and I'm a follower of Christ. Jesus was all God and he was all man. And I think that's something that we forget as Christians because we feel like we have to live up to this standard, a standard that's really not there, a standard we kind of make up in our own minds. Mm -hmm. And we forget that we have to actually deal with the human side of us just as much as we have to be the follower of Christ that we are. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's really just helped me to acknowledge both sides of me and to feed both sides and cater to both sides, not just one, because you need both. You are both. So you have to live your life in that way, in a way that is healthy and for you also like to be healthy and like your friendships and stuff like that and so like that's ways that it's helped me like communicating with my friends like I'm not just like lashing out at my friends and stuff like that when they piss me off or like say something that I don't like or like if they don't (laughs) if they don't meet a need or something like that that I need I have to realize okay first of all where is this need coming from like why do I not even why do I need this but I just know that it's a need for me and it's okay because every human is different we all have different needs and Not all of our friends and stuff like that can meet those needs. So, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, well said. There, there are things that um, these these professionals can offer to you that um, even as as a pastor that I'm just limited on. There, there, I'm not going to shy away from moments where I say, "Listen, this is beyond my my expertise, my purview." Like, you need to talk to a professional. That they're going to really help you um, with this. Um, And so, yeah, understanding that this is it's all intertwined. Okay, it's not treat the body or the soul it's both that is who you are is body and soul okay and they're intertwined i would say for me um really you guys covered a lot of of what i would say as well it really helped me to understand my struggles i um, I was focusing on symptoms not really the root cause of these issues Um, i usually prefer or i usually refer to um, professional counselors um, as basically professional puzzlers um, they, you, you come to them and you've got these pieces. Some of these pieces are broken, um, and they help you figure out and assemble some of these pieces and put some of these things back in place and help you to understand kind of why you're going through what you're going through. Um, but not only that, they give you the tools with how to deal with it. 
They give you, they literally uh, put tools in your tool belt for those moments when you're alone on a Thursday evening and you're depressed. They give you practical tools to help you know, okay, like this is not going to last forever. And here's the things that I talked about with my counselor that we can rehearse and the things that we can do. And so it's, it's very much more practical than you would imagine, right? Um, and so I would say that, but um, also I would say I am a healthier, I would say I am a better, healthier disciple of Jesus because I've seen a counselor for years now. I mean that confidently. I am a better disciple of Jesus. And, and the verse that came to mind for me was John 10:10, 10, 10, and it says this. Um, Jesus says, I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. So for me, I feel like this has been a means or a tool that God has used to help me step even more into that life of abundance, right? Everything I have and need is in Christ. Don't, don't mishear me. But what I am saying is this life of abundance, I'm experiencing it more. I'm realizing it more through this means of professional counseling that God has provided for, for us and, and for you and for everybody. Um, and so I would say that's the biggest difference for me. Um, okay, so there's, there's people in, um, in the crowd here or people that are watching online, and their thought is going to be like, man, I kind of suspect that I need, that I probably should see a counselor. This is something that I've been thinking about. Um, I think we can all agree the hardest part of seeing a counselor is scheduling that first appointment. And then going, okay? That's the hardest part, right? Easily. So many people over the years that I've connected to counselors, by far the hardest step is getting that date on the calendar and getting them to go, okay? Um, 